So, Alex. So, Benjamin. That's not my name. You bastard. What is your name? Just Ben. What is your name? Just, 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 just Ben. That's it. Just Ben. That's all it says on my birth certificate. Uh, I've uh, already been wrongly ben. named. How dare you presume my name in 2020, you bastard. So welcome back, everyone. Let's run that intro before this gets a little bit out of hand. Okay, fair enough. Well, welcome back, everyone, to On The Spotcast. It's our weekly podcast. Uh, However longer it goes on weekly for, I don't know. Obviously, sooner or later, I'll be going back to work. So hopefully I'll still have time to record these things. But I'm sure we will. I thought you were actually back at work now, or at least not as much. Because you said, like, from the last podcast, you said you couldn't record during the whole week. Well, no, that's because I was... well, that's because I was doing other stuff, doesn't you know? I was, I was uh, helping my dad at some points during the week, but no, I'm not pu- not back properly at work until the fourth of July. Uh, so sense. yes, anyway, welcome back to on the spotcast. It's podcast number fifteen, um, and yeah, it's a it's a packed podcast. We've got our theme for the day. We've got some comments. We've got. Uh, Weird, like the audio on the on the Bluetooth speaker for some reason. <laughs> um, but we've got all kinds of uh, things coming up today. Um, so our topic for today is Alex's choice. It is well, I'll let you explain. It, actually, it's probably easier. Well, there's a YouTuber that I watch, and Bruno watches as well called the Act Man. And on his second channel, he did a video which was basically like the games he grew up in, grew, grew up in, grew up, you know, playing and sort of yeah. the games that he's played across his childhood and that, which stand out the most to him above, you know, all the others for various reasons. And that was a video that I watched, one of the videos I watched recently, and that is what inspired me, you know, to do that as a topic, because I thought that'd be quite an interesting sort of, you know, look down memory lane and stuff. Fair and enough. plus, that'd also be if anyone wanted to put their own um, games in the comments as well. I thought that'd be quite interesting to read. Fair enough. Well, yeah. So uh, we've both gone uh, through now. Obviously, I was sort of thinking what defined a landmark game. Um, now, in my opinion, that what I've used as a definition for landmark game is the games that just kind of. Um, had the biggest impact on me or meant the most to me? Maybe. Yeah, I, ga- I would totally agree with that. The games that I played the most more than others. Just you know, games that I, I when I think back to the gen- to the generation, I remember playing more than anything else. Um, well, like I said, the ones yeah. that stand, you know, from all these games that you played and like loved, the ones that you know you put above all the rest. Yeah. Well, anyway, yeah, so what I've done, I think that's what you've done as well, we've both split it up into uh, generational categories. Um, so, you yeah. know, PS2, PS3, PS4. Um, well, for me, it'd be PS2, well, yeah. 360, Xbox One. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, vice versa. Um, so what we're going to do, I think, I think we should split it up into our, like, I'll do PS2, then you do PS2, then I'll do PS3, then you do Xbox 360, and... That is exactly yeah, how I, I um, was going to suggest we do it. So, yeah, um, do you want me to go first? Yeah, you go first. Okay, so I was thinking back to the PS2. Um, so I got a PS2 when I was quite young, and the earliest memory I have of playing the PlayStation 2 
is playing Jack and Dexter the Precursor Legacy. Which I'm sure you guessed I was going to pick. <laughs> Um, I was kind of waiting for you. I honestly thought you were going to say like GTA Vice City or something, but then Jack, Jack and Dexter, I'm like, yeah, because you love Jack and Dexter and you brought all the ringmasters and that. No, nah, I wasn't. That's clearly on one of those games that's really dear to you. I wouldn't pick Vice City, but I'll get onto that one in a minute. Um, but yeah, no, the, oh. the earliest memory I have of playing PlayStation is playing Jack and Dexter. Now, I'm sure, obviously, I did own a PlayStation before I played those. It might have been Crash before that, but I really can't exactly remember. But the earliest proper very good memory I have is sitting in the living room playing through Jack and Daxter Progress Legacy, which was, you know, Naughty Dogs, follow up to Crash Bandicoot and it was my first sort of foray into the into the world of platforming and and exploring and open world and bashing things and collecting things and all that kind of stuff. And it it's still a game that, you know, stands up today and um it's definitely one of my earliest memories and like you say I've, I've played it many occasions on the PS2 uh, then I played it on the PS3 then I played it on the PS4 so you know I've definitely um, you'll probably play on the PS5 <laughs> yeah sure yeah definitely um, but yeah so that's my first one my second one uh, I don't think you would have guessed this one either but it's the original Splinter Cell the original not Chaos Theory or Pandora Tomorrow I picked the original just because it was my first outing into it, so that's why I define that as the landmark point, because without that I wouldn't have played the other ones. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the original Splinter Cell was, if you don't know, uh, a Tom Clancy game. Um, it was a very, very, very high stealth um, sort of action game, I guess. I don't really know how to define it. Um, it's kind of a game where you play as like a, a NSA agent who you know, you're you're competing story missions and there's a lot of very stealthy elements to it. Um, a lot of sneaking around, very, very good use of light and darkness and shadows and light meters and sound meters and it's just a very good game. Um and it was really a game that I didn't actually buy for myself because my mum actually bought it for my dad at the time when they were still in love and not hating each other. Um <laughs> You're not got anything down there, Alex? So. Okay, hello? Are you still there? What? What, what? what are you doing? No. no, I was just like, I was like adjusting some of the stuff on my bed when you were talking, so I didn't quite hear, uh, I didn't quite hear what you said. You're just making extra noise on the microphone, I think, really. No. But anyway, like I said, so Splinter Cell, the first one, definitely was a landmark for me, which led on to the games like Pandora Tomorrow and Chaos Theory, although Pandora Tomorrow is my favourite. Um, Chaos Theory sort of lost a bit of the stealth element, but it was still a good game. Um, and my last entry on the PS2 that I picked was GTA 3. Now, obviously, you said... GTA you open world. Yes, exactly. That, well, that was the first GTA I played. Once again, it was another one of the games that my dad got, but never played, I don't think, much. Um, I wasn't always allowed to play it, actually. I used to have to sort of beg him to let me play it, because, you know, it was an 18 game, and it was seen as being, you know, too... too... Uh, dangerous for me to play it, you know? Like, I'd have too many impressions about beating prostitutes down with bats or something, I don't know. But, um, yeah, it was my first real sort of taste of an open world, as I guess it was for many people, really, um, where the whole real open world genre really began, really, I guess. But it was a re it is and was a really great open world game, full of great stories, characters, the world that I just absolutely know, like the back of my hand, and don't even need to use the map anymore to get to places. Um, so, yeah, I played it a lot. It's one of them games where you just... Can... No, carry on. Yeah, so I was just I was saying my thing when you um, just finished. Okay, all right, fair enough. Um, I was just all I was going to add was um, it's one of those games where I uh, enjoy playing it just by sort of existing in the world. I remember I I um I used to have one of those you know you remember the old sort of steering wheels that used to get real, like ethereal sort of yeah. thing. So I used to have one of them, which I used to use either on Gran Turismo a lot of the time, but I used to hook that up on GTA as well and just drive around the world using it, sort of almost simulating life in Liberty City, but in the, in the most clunkiest way. 
But um, yeah, it's definitely an early memory that I have a lot of. And obviously that's led on to me, you know, enjoying many, many open worlds ever since. Um, so, what was your point? I was going to say, it'd be interesting to see how the open world genre would have turned out without GTA 3. Because like, um, Saints Row, Red Dead, you know, even stuff like Prototype, Infamous, etc. The concept of an open world game really owes itself to GTA 3, you know, doing it, doing it so well and doing it so successfully. One might have to say would ever have existed. Hmm, that is a good point as well. I don't know. I mean, I guess someone would have come up with the idea, but obviously there were. I mean, GTA before that was kind of an open world, but it was obviously top down still. So this was the first proper 3D yeah. open world. So yeah, I mean, any open world game you can think of, you know, Witcher, Shadow of Mordor, uh, any other one of the books. Yeah, just, any any single open world game, even semi open world game that has you driving around a big map with things in it, it pretty much comes from there. Right? Yeah. You know, and so yeah, it's a lot of a lot, a lot of a lot of games, um, you know, owe themselves to that format. Um, so, what are your PS2 choices? Well, on my PS2, I mostly played um, Star Wars games. Yeah, yeah. I got. I thought you were going to. There are a few exceptions, like I had the game for the 2007 Transformers film, which I got again on 360. Um, first Kill Zone. There were a couple of driving games and like um, World War Two like fighter plane games that my dad also um, got, but mostly with Star Wars games. And the three that stand out most for me are the first Lego Star Wars, which while I will definitely say is not the best best Lego game, and the best Lego Star Wars, it was my first video game I ever. That is why I wanted to, you know, start playing video Christ, games. I, I love I mean, Star Wars. I, uh... I love Lego. Not I sort of forgot it. I sort of forgot it existed. To be honest, I'm sort of almost thinking of more landmark games I could have included while I'm still talking. But yeah, no, I forgot Lego Star Wars even existed. <laughs> well, I included it, so you didn't have to. Fair enough. But like I said, that was the game that got me, you know, wanted to actually, you know, get into games because I love Star Wars Lego and well, Star Wars Lego and Star Wars Lego. And then I saw them making a video game of it, and I was like, oh my god, I want to play that. I'll play that. Um, and the other two are the original Star Wars Battlefronts. The first one yeah. because it was the first game that I sort of, you know, really got into. And the second one because I, I feel like it came out in 2005. It's, I've played games that do everything it does better, but my God, I can still put that on and play it non-stop for hours and still, you know, absolutely enjoy every single second of it, even though I've done everything in it. I know everything about it. You know, all yeah, you know, everything explored the game like top mm. to bottom, left, right, inside out, blah blah blah. I still can put that game in and play it 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 and, play it and still absolutely love it. Yeah, I know. So I, um, I remember spending quite a lot of time playing as well. I'm playing of you, in, in, incidentally, uh, quite a few times. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's definitely. I think for a lot of for a lot of uh, Star Wars fans of, of that era, it was definitely uh, up there. Yeah. Um, so those I, are my um, three PS2 ones. I probably would have picked. I mean, like from your choices, I probably would have picked Lego Star Wars and that on there if I didn't feel like Jack and Daxter and Splinter Cell and GTA 3 had more of an effect on me. They're definitely still games that are landmarks to me that I would have enjoyed. But I kind of wanted to keep my list to about three, and so I didn't go on forever. Um, yeah, because once, and once you start doing like honourable mentions and stuff, that's when you can end up adding like a whole like other twenty games. And oh, that. Yeah, yeah. Whereas it's best to just stick to the you know the, just keep focused and keep on the the ones above all others. Interesting, what you were saying though is how much do you think out of out of G something like GT3, you know, Star Wars Battlefront came about? Because once again, we're still talking about elements of kind of like they are open world levels. We've sort of you know. <laughs> Yeah, the maps in um, both the OG, but sort of the newer ones as well, but definitely the OG, like the original ones, they're like these big, sprawling, like, yeah. like things that you just yeah. go all around in like, all the vehicles and the ships and that. So I wonder how much of that sort of stuff owes itself back to GTA again, you know? That's what I'm thinking, mm. you know? There's a lot of... Uh... You know, it's kind of like um, you know when they when people talk about ancient history and they all reckon we've descended from like 
some person that shags someone loads of times. It's kind of like that. GTA just sort of shagged all the developers and they were all having some part of his genes in, the, in some strange way. A crude way of saying it, but you we're understand. Basically, we're basically sort of setting up a potential future topic, you know, like sort of accidentally in a way. Yeah, I don't know how we'd ever cover that though. But anyway, let's move on yeah. to yeah. PlayStation 3, Xbox 360. Um, yeah. So... This is, when we, this is a generation where we both, you know, and a lot of people proper got hardcore into gaming, I'd say. Well, I suppose, yeah, I suppose before it was sort of childhood, um, I don't know, childhood gaming, I guess, like, not competitive, yeah. I guess is what I want to say. Um, whereas I think yeah. when we jumped up a generation, it's more fresh in our minds, and therefore I think it was a lot more competitive between everyone. Um, and definitely where video games became quite a mainstream thing in, in, in online, you know, and YouTube coming about, you know, YouTube gaming, all that stuff sort of started around 20, 2006 and 2007. So, um, you know, it all became rather, rather a bigger thing, didn't it? I think really. Yeah. Um, so my PS3 games that I picked, um, you can probably guess a couple of them, I'm sure. Okay, I'd be interested to hear what your guesses are. Okay. Go for you it. You want me to... Um, yeah, you just say it, okay. just say it. Well, one of them will, one of them will definitely be Modern Warfare 2. Mm hmm <laughs> And the other one... GTA 5? No. You were, oh. right, you were right with the first one. Um, yeah, of course I am. <laughs> Yeah, you write the first one. The first one I wrote down was Modern Warfare 2, but I couldn't not write it down, you know? Modern, Warf Modern Warfare 2 was the first PS3 game I played. I got it, I got my PlayStation 3 on... your most played PS3 game. Well, I think it, it might have been, yeah. I'm not entirely sure about the hours, but yeah. Um, so I got my PlayStation 3 on Christmas 2009. I got Modern Warfare two the same day and I have very fond memory still of Christmas morning playing through the favela whilst my neighbours yeah. were coming around the house trying to talk to me and I was kind of just ignoring them because uh, <laughs> I was playing it. I know exactly but it was the first time I'd ever played a proper first person shooter um, and it was the first time I'd ever played online as well I'd never ever gone online before then so it's the first time I ever did that and for me it's just it still is the best Call of Duty game. It's the one I have the most memories of. I played through the campaign like ten times. As you said, I have seventeen days worth of cumulative match time online because um, I played it non-stop every day for about a year, um, apart from school. Um, so yeah, that was definitely a big landmark game to me, and it led on to obviously every COD since. So uh, yeah, there's no way I could include the landmark games that meant a lot to me and not include this um, so the second game which I'm surprised you didn't well I don't know if you would get this because I probably didn't talk about it a lot but it is WSC Real 11 that's a snooker game it is that's World Snooker Championship Real 11 oh, I should have guessed something like that mm. especially since was like the latest when you had us drive an hour to lower stock just to get it <laughs> No, that was a fun trip, apart from the scummy people of Lowestoft ruining it with their drug addictions. Let's not talk about that. We can make a special Lowestoft episode if you're one of the podcasts. <laughs> we could do it like on the road, couldn't we, where we travel to all these different places and just comment on the people and the place when we're there. We should do something like that. We should like, vlog it. That might be quite a fun little vlog. Could but do. Anyway. But anyway, yeah, so... WS Serial 11 was the last in a series of when there was a time when we were getting a snooker game every year. There was a time where from maybe, I think, well I think it was, yeah, I think there was a snooker game every single year up until 2011. Um, because snooker had become very mainstream in the late 80s, 90s and 2000s. And all of a sudden, the PlayStation did that. I remember owning previous ones on the Wii before that. And, I mean, obviously, the one I played the most, however, was WS Serial 11, which was a PS3 game, as we know. 
And the reason I put it on the list is because, honestly, I think it was what made, got me into snooker the most. I'm a big snooker fan, as you may know. Um, and I did and used to enjoy watching on the TV, but I was never that interested in playing it until I started playing these games. Um, and honestly, there's a lot of stuff to learn about snooker. Um, there's a lot of rules, there's a lot of, you know, just the whole way the game works. And I feel like, you know, playing this game, you know, in campaign mode, well, the career mode, I should say, uh, for just years and years and years. And um, I didn't stop playing it that long ago, to be honest. Um, it even went through two PS3s after I dropped one of them down the stairs. Uh, <laughs> And it's just, it was just a game that meant the most to me. I played it so many times. Even when the online was d completely dead, I never played online on it. By the time I bought the game, it was completely dead and buried. Which means I can never get the platinum for it, because there's loads of online trophies. Um, but I got every other trophy. I played the game countless amount of times. It developed my massive love for the game. Taught me so much about snooker, the rules, how the game plays, the physics of just how the balls move around the table I learned so much from it so it's definitely a game and obviously as you say it led on to me now owning Snooker 19 which is what I was playing just before I spoke to you for the podcast so uh, it's still on my TV now as I'm looking at it um, so it's definitely developed into a big love um, my next game is and I'm surprised you didn't get this I feel like an idiot because I literally like a few minutes ago thought instead of GTA 5 I should have guessed I'm trying to <laughs> well, funny you should say that because my next game is Uncharted 2. Yeah. Um, <laughs> when you were like, I think literally five minutes ago, I was thinking, why didn't I pick Uncharted? Well, you should have because that was also another game that I got not long after. Yeah. Um, I got Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 um, that year, so I got Uncharted 2. Um, I didn't come in via Uncharted 1. Sorry to all those people that don't like that sort of thing, but that's just how it was. Uh, I did go back and play it though. I def I bought it after I played through Uncharted 2, so I haven't, uh, you know, I didn't skip over it completely. I did go back and play it retrospectively. Um, so yeah, Uncharted 2, I got a few months after that Christmas where I got my PS3. I remember seeing it advertised online and just sort of thinking it looked cool. <laughs> Uh, obviously, I had no idea what a great game it would turn out to be. Um, I remember buying it, and it was the first, it was sort of. You know, the first style of game that I played where it was kind of like a, a platformer action adventure type thing with all the third person shooting. I don't remember ever playing a lot of games with a lot of third person shooting apart from perhaps the early GTA games at least. Um, so it's definitely a game that really you know, stood out to me and it's a genre that I've loved playing ever since and it's a game series that I haven't enjoyed playing ever since throughout the PS3. The Nathan Drake collection, Uncharted 4, Lost Legacy, you know, and moving on to the games that I've spun off from that. Um, so it's definitely a very big game for me. My last game, which I think there may be a slight crossover with for us, um, was Assassin's Creed 2. Now, I have, a, I have a funny feeling you may have picked it. Um, I don't know. But... Assassin's Creed 2 is obviously it's the first Assassin's Creed I played. We talked about this not long ago when we talked about um, you know sequels and things like that. Yeah. Um, but it's once again it's another game that I got around the time where I bought my PS3. Never played any game like that before. Open world. You know it was obviously Assassin's Creed at that time was a big thing for everyone. It was a completely new thing for everyone. And it's obviously a game that I've loved playing and a game that I still like playing and a series that has developed into many, many games that I've loved playing. Um, but it all began back then. Uh, and yeah, you know, it's just just a very good game and I have very fond memories, once again, of listening to that old music of running around Florence and stabbing people to death. In real life and in the game. Well, I have never been to Florence in real life, but uh, I'm sure it's a bit different now. But anyway, so uh, what are your Xbox 360 games? Well, one of them is, uh, as you sort of semi guessed correct, <laughs> Assassin's Creed 2. Um, unlike you, I started with, I actually got the first two, Assassin's Creed 1 and Assassin's Creed 2 for my birthday at the same time, but of course I played the first one first. Yeah. I, st I do like the first one, I respect it for it, like, <laughs> starting what became, like, my favourite franchise. I know where this is going. Ever, 
like all my love from Assassin's Creed, of course, sparks from that. But let's be honest, as I've said before on podcasts, it is definitely more a concept slash tech demo than an actual fully fledged game. Well, Assassin's Creed 2 is the fully fledged game that Assassin's Creed 1 should have been. Well, I went back and, and as, you, as you know, I went back and um, played Assassin's Creed 1 retrospectively after Assassin's Creed 2. And I always wonder because. I always found Assassin's Creed 1 quite boring, and as I famously said on this channel, I fell asleep while playing it. <laughs> um, yeah. And I always wondered to myself, and it's just like you said there, um, w what would my opinion be on it if I had played it first? Would I like it more if I played it first, I wonder? Or do I like it less now because I know what it could have been? I don't know, because, like I, like I said, I... I I like every Assassin's Creed game. I probably will like every Assassin's Creed game. And the first one, like you said, I would say that if anyone was like getting into the series, I would definitely tell them to play the first one before the second, just on the off chance that they do end up like not bothering like getting like through the first one after. But that is, that I still, even though, even though I have played Two Brothers and all of them, and I know what the first one could have been and kind of should have been, I still like the first one because I was. Like I said, I respect it for what it started and what it set up. And of course, thanks to like Revelations mm. and the Crusade, I like Altair and his story a lot more. And Ooh. also Crusade set in the fact that we hadn't got, re apart from like the flashbacks on Revelations, we never went back to the third Crusade, so the first game still has the unique mm. setting. Aspect well, the old, the, it, but yeah. The Altair memories in revelations were just a big kick in the balls to what Assassin's Creed 1 should have been because when you see you start playing it and that you're like yeah this is what it should have been like and if you ever go back after that and yeah. you play the combat and wow mm. yeah it's uh, so repetitive <laughs> yeah like I say just going back to Assassin's Creed 2 as I said liked the first game loved the I loved the second game and the second game was what made me love Assassin's Creed like just even from like the beginning when you're just playing as Ezio even before he's an assassin just going around Florence and that it's just, it's just such a unique like video game experience and the story when they show from his birth to like when he's in his 40s just I did like AC, Assassin's Creed 3 and Unity kind of did a similar thing but I don't think I've seen a video game where you have played as this one character for so much of his life that's just such a, like, something that I think more video games should kind of, like, take inspiration from that sort of method of telling its story. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, Assassin's Creed 2. My second one is what made me, was my first Xbox 360 game. My first, not my first first-person shooter, because that would be the first kill time, but the first first-person shooter that I actually liked. <laughs> and, like I said, it's the game that got me once in Xbox 360, and that is Halo 3. That was, like, as soon as I saw gameplay of, like, Halo 3, I was like, oh, my God, I want that. I don't know, it just sort of clicked with me. It's like, oh, my God, I want to play that, I want to play that. And I said, it's my first, it's what got me, it's made me want a 360, it's my first 360 game. It's what started me on what is, I think, the best first-person shooter franchise ever. And after Assassin's Creed and maybe Mass Effect, it might be my favourite game series ever. And... It's just something magical and unique and special about Halo 3, which I think even Bruno agrees. Even though I would say Halo 4 is my favourite Halo game, Halo 4 is my favourite Halo game, I would definitely say that the best Halo game, which I think is the most quintessential of what Halo like, is and should be, is definitely Halo 3. It's something really hard to explain unless you've actually played it. But yeah. I'm sure you'll agree, like, with Uncharted 2, you're like, even though I may think so, and, like, so-and-so might be, like, so, uh, you may think I, Uncharted 4 is my favourite, but the best Uncharted, I would definitely say, is Uncharted 2. That's just a sort of, sort of, sort of an example, sort of, so you kind of understand where I'm coming from. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. yeah. Um, my third... I would go for... My third would be Mass Effect 1, because while I think it's the weakest Mass Effect... Um, that is still what sort of got me into, it was my first RPG, so it got me into all of that. It got me really sort of into long, longer video games, you know, like going from like things that are just like five to ten hours to something that's like 30 plus hours. And it really sort of what got me into video, game, like video games as a method of like storytelling, because Mass Effect's story is a big part. 
throughout the whole original trilogy is a big part of why the trilogy is so great. It's its characters, its story, the choices, how you can affect the story. And I say Halo 3, there's just something magical and unique about Mass Effect, the whole trilogy, but I would definitely say the first one because that was the first one for me. Even though it's a massively flawed game, I would definitely put two and three above it. Mass Effect 1, as it was the first, and it just introduced this amazing, beautiful science fiction universe with these characters that you grow to love across the first game and then, of course, the second and third, etc. It's just something it's just something about the first Mass Effect. And I'd be doing a trilogy replay this Christmas and I'm really looking forward to reliving the um all three other games. And my fourth and final one is one that I, I debated on a bit, but I would probably have to go for Gears of War Three, which is kind of a weird one, but I'm not a big multiplayer one partly because I can't play online, but still I'm not anyway. But Gears of War Three's multiplayer is it also Gears of War 3 might possibly be my most played Xbox 360 game because of its multiplayer. I got so addicted to its multiplayer for <laughs> so long because it, it just sort of it gelled me. I played Gears 1 and Gears 2 and that, but Gears 3 was when the franchise just it, it just reached perfect it just reached perfection and I just got so into its multiplayer and its unlocking system and like just its map design and its mechanics and all that. It just I just love Gears of War 3's multiplayer, and then you've got Horde and all that stuff that goes on it, and the campaign, which was just such a brilliant conclusion to the original like Gears trilogy, and have, of course, after reading all the novels as well, it's tied into Gears 2 and 3 and filled in a lot of the gaps. Gears 3 becomes something truly special. So yeah, there they were. I could have gone for several other ones other than Gears 3, but I just had to do Gears 3 because it's the 360 game that I've played the most. Fair enough. Um, so I think before we go on for too long, we'll move on to our last generation, which is uh, the current generation. Um, so obviously it's harder to pick. It's soon to be the last generation. Well, soon to be, yes. Um, it's it's kind of hard, I think, to pick landmark games for this generation, simply because they're so recent. Um, and I always feel like a landmark game... Do you really have a sort of nostalgia, do you, like you do for the older ones? Not necessarily, no, is but... Um, of, is it a big part of what makes a landmark game a landmark game? Yeah, so basically what I've had to do is I've had to... I pick four games that I feel like I played the most, I remember playing the most, and, you know... You know, I, I, I have the best experiences in... Um, so uh, you can probably guess a couple of them, um, but I'm going to get into them anyway. The first game I've picked is Fallout 4. Oh, yeah, that is one I would probably, I'd probably forget about it, and then when you'd say it, I'd be like, damn it, why the fuck didn't I pick that? Mm, so, Sanctuary Hills. Oh yeah, don't worry, I'm going to get onto it. I'm going to get onto it, I'm going to get onto it. Um, so yeah, Fallout 4 was the first time, well it wasn't the first time I played Fallout, I actually played Fallout 3, but I found it so depressing and boring, I just couldn't play it. Um, it Fallout 4, um, I probably wasn't going to buy it when it first came out, because I had reservations from Fallout 3 still. However, having watched gameplay and seeing how much things like the gunplay had improved, um, and just general things like that, I took the plunge after watching the other YouTubers play it and bought it for myself. And what transpired from there was perhaps a year's worth of me playing it non-stop, exploring the world. Um, I completely explored the world, every single last map marker, every single last thing I just scanned. I even got to one point when I was so obsessed with missing anything that I started from the top of the map and I started running across the map in a sideways fashion, moving down a little bit every time to make sure that if I missed anything I'd pick it up on the way. So I was covering everything. I even compared my map with the official IGN map that has all the markers unlocked to make sure I wasn't missing anything. Um, so I became very much obsessed with clearing the world on that game. And as you said, I also... Uh, say again? I said before Witcher, there was Fallout 4. There was. And that is, is that's irony as well for the next thing. Um, but as you also said, Sanctuary Hills, Fallout 4 brought in a workshop mode where you can build settlements and you can, uh, there's plenty of settlements across the whole map, but I have put in a lot of work into 
the kind of uh, into my current Sanctuary Hills build. It's got a wall around it, buildings, hospitals, a, a mall, houses. I mean, it, it's it's one day when it's done, I want to make a video showcasing it. But um, yeah, I've put in a lot of work to it. And it's a lot of work that I've been doing recently as well. The last few days, I've been building building a lot in there. In fact, I've built so much now that the game struggles to run. Um, and, well, I did, yeah. One one night, I was building things, and it was I was getting to place maybe two objects down before the game would just crash. Um, so yeah, it was quite bad. Um, how come that sort of captain? How come that captured you so much? Because I have all these like sort of custom things and that, like. It's, I guess whenever you get these things, whenever I got it originally, I uh, obviously everyone intends to try and build something quite cool. Um, but often yeah. what you end up doing is just to satisfy the settle settlers, you end up just slapping together a quick wooden hut as quick as you can, slam some sleeping bags into some water and some food, and that's it. So they're happy. So you satisfy what the quest wants you to do. Um, and I think with Sanctuary Hills, I was always, I always, I don't know, I guess it being like, I guess it meant more to me because I felt almost kind of like, as that's where I was before the bombs hit the world, I guess I kind of felt like my in-game character kind of owed it to the world to kind of make it what it was. Yeah. If that makes sense. I don't know. It's It's... And it was around that time that I started watching a lot of YouTubers that were building things like that. And I used to, I started to watch a lot of Fallout 4 specific YouTubers that only made videos about building things in workshop mode. And I guess it just sort of spiralled out of control. And then once I built a wall around it, I thought, well, this looks this looks too empty. I've got to start adding things in. It doesn't look right. It doesn't look like a real town. It does, And it just, it's just one to more. And every sort of so often I just think of another thing that I can add or another thing that I can change. And it's chopped and changed over the years. And it's just still ever getting bigger. But like I say now, it's got to the point where whenever I go into Sanctuary Hills, I've got near to it, I think I drop down to about 10 FPS and that's about as high as it'll go. You can really notice sort difference. Of, sort of like after every time you build, like you sort of explore, look around, and you think, "I've got just this one thing, just this one thing, and it'll be perfect." And then you do that, and you look and think, um, "Maybe if I add this." And we this, do, you that, do, you then, think then that, and then you think to yourself, well, "Oh, well, maybe that bit of grass there doesn't look right, so I'll move that." Oh, I don't want them weeds there. Or I think. <laughs> That wall there is not right quite. I think you know it would have a guard post there. Or that milk bottle in that fridge isn't quite accurate enough. I need to just move that. To... And then you know, and then for a long while I was, you know, you used to have to glitch the thing to build it. You know, because normally the the settlements yeah. have a size limit, so you can only build them so big. So for a long while I I used an exploit to make sure the size didn't increase, so I could carry on building infinitely past what the game should allow you to. Um, very, very much obviously for the fact that it needs to run and um, going past the build limit starts to kind of, you know, make the game not run well. But um, yeah, so for a long while I was building the whole game using glitches, but then obviously now with the addition of mods onto the PS4 and console versions, the whole thing has just taken another step forward. Because now you've got glitching tools that they've made. You've got all these extra unlockable objects that weren't available. Because the workshop mode only had like a, a selection of objects that available. But the people that mod the game have gone in and they've found every single little object that Bethesda has used, houses everything, and they've made it completely available to you. So you can use everything that they use to make the game in your settlement now. So, I mean, it's just completely... Out. Huh? I wonder how many people bought Fallout 4 and have just like done the like building the town stuff because it sounds like it's a whole game within it can you be know, a guess, already guess. massive game. Oh, it is. It's definitely it definitely is. I mean, I guess a lot of people did it satisfied. You know, did it enough so the quests were satisfied, and so Preston Garvey wouldn't keep telling you that there's another settlement that needs our help. Um, that guy. Yeah. Um, 
but as much as I enjoy going around the world, I've probably end up spending a lot more time. I think I was looking at my save yesterday in Fallout 4, and I've got 14 days worth of time so far in the game. Which sounds like quite a lot, doesn't it, actually? <laughs> when you think about it. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's just a game, and especially with mods now, it's just a game that even when the mods bring things and you go through your menu and the workshop mode, and you're like, oh my god, look at all this stuff. This is just so much more stuff I can add to it now. I need to go back and add all this stuff again to the stuff I've already finished. You know? You know, all of a sudden you think, oh, but I did that. I did it in this different way, but now I think I can I can get rid of that stuff I did and do it in a better way now. You know? So, um, yeah, there's just definitely more stuff. One day when it's finished, if it's ever finished, I will make a video on it, but it's just, yeah. You'll be able to show it off to your grandkids as well, because it'll probably just, take that long. I don't know, I just, I don't know why I've got, I mean, it got to a point when, as you know, I when I was still making old Moaning Mondays videos, where I literally drew out blueprints by hand to where I wanted buildings to be in Sanctuary. You know, so it, it even made its way out of the game into my life so it definitely became a big thing um however we're going to move on so my next game is as you correctly guessed the witcher 3 hey, yeah. <laughs> i could not put it in really um the witcher 3 now what more can i say about this game that i haven't already said many times now it was my first i think <laughs> it was my first real game that I got into in an RPG sense, if you know what I mean. Before playing The Witcher yeah. 3, I hadn't really played a lot of games like that, um, if any. Um, and I don't even remember why I wanted to get into The Witcher 3, so I think it's because I just watched PlayStation Access play it a little bit, and I just found it looked interesting. I never ever expected to get into it as much as I did, I don't think. But honestly, it's just one of the best games I've ever played. The story is amazing. The characters are so brilliant and well acted. The world is composed um, amazingly too, down to the last detail. And it's just one of the most amazing games ever. And I played it for many, many months, just every day getting lost in the world. Also, once again, in the same sort of sense of Fallout 4, kind of lost in doing pointless things improving myself you know collecting old swords selling it for more money improving my things just doing all the sort of things you do in an rpg just sort of farming your way yeah. but happily farming along um but it, yeah it's just one of the best games i've ever played and i can't ever say and i hope they do bring out a ps5 version um so i can platinum it again um it's also worth mentioning I do have a platinum for Fallout 4 as well. There seem to be two platinums that are rarely got by people for a couple of trophies, which are three and Fallout 4, but I do have both. Um, so my next game, I'm going to blast through these last two quickly. Um, it was Horizon, Horizon Zero Dawn. Uh, I picked it once again, an RPG element, but I think a lot of people really love playing Horizon Zero Dawn after Killzone sort of, you know had its time and developers moved on to this and everyone all of a sudden loved this post-apocalyptic game with these RPG elements but also you know taking on these massive you know machine creatures and a, a really great story to go along with it and I really have great memories playing it and platinuming it um, and my final game is God of War the PS4 one now the reason I picked this is because once again it's a series that I had never taken an interest in up until this moment but I bought because I liked how it looked. I liked how it looked, how it played, and it just what really drew to me was the whole third person behind the shoulder sort of RPG style, I guess. Um, and I ended up playing it. And the reason I picked it is because it's just got a, well, you know, it is one of the most best games on PS4 you can play. It's got an amazing story, brilliant world, brilliant acting, everything. And it's also the reason I pick it as a landmark game is because it got me into the other God of War games. I actually then went back via PlayStation Now and played through all the other God of War games before that to get the story into myself. And those are other games that I turned out that I really, really enjoyed playing. Um, so it definitely is a landmark game for me. And that is my PS4 selection. So many, so many like ones became God of War fans just off the back of the fourth one. It's crazy, especially considering it's so different to the others. So you were still able to go back to the originals and really enjoy them. Yeah, I know it's, it is. It is a bit of a strange one. I guess. I don't know. I guess it's. I guess it's just 
missed it. I guess I just never took an intro. I don't know why. I guess I just didn't. But there you go. What, so what are yours, anyway? I have three. The first one was my most anticipated Xbox One slash PS4 game, and that was Batman Arkham Knight. Fair yeah, enough. Not Halo 5. <laughs> not Halo 5. So there are a lot of ones, especially as I'm a big Xbox One, those ones say, what have you got Halo 5? Well, in hindsight, that turned out to be a good thing, considering Halo 5 was a bit shit. Um, <laughs> Batman Arkham Knight, though, you have no idea how much I squealed when I first started that. And I think I actually told you after the Ace Chemicals bit. Yeah. Uh, it, I don't remember, I just sent you this massive, like, long thing, which was just capital letters screaming, because I, I loved it so much, and I still do. As a Batman fan, for as long as I can remember, Batman Arkham Knight is just the game that I'd always dreamt of. Yeah. As a, like, it's just the most perfect and complete Batman simulator. You have everything the original Arkham games did, added to, refined to perfection, you've got all of Gotham that go around, you've got the Batmobile, like, it's just... Yeah. Like I said, it's my most anticipated next-gen game, and the, just my fate, just, oh my god, just so good, <laughs> just so good. Yeah, I think we get the point. <laughs> number, yeah. Number two, uh, Assassin's Creed Origins. Okay. Because it's got possibly my most favourite... It's got not just my favourite world of the Assassin's Creed series, it's got my most favourite open world I think I've ever been in. It's just from it's just the first second to the last second of doing the main game, I was 110% immersed and engrossed in that game's beautiful recreation of ancient Egypt. And just explore... Like, when you ride around, you just see these... Like, the gorgeous, like... You know all the dune, all the dunes and the pyramids and the sphinx, and then you have Alexandria and Thebes and Memphis. Just these mass, like it's just such a brilliant, beautiful atmosphere that the whole world has, and the DLC as well. Mm. It can, when you go to like the afterlife from that, it's just so like you're just there. You're just one hundred percent there. You just you don't even think that you're playing a game because it's just done crafted so well and so realistically. And plus, Bayek, like who'd have thought? Like uh, in just one game, Ubisoft would manage to create a character who manages to reach Ezio levels of brilliance in just his first game. There is a reason people still want a fucking Bayek sequel because he's just him and his story is just so good. And yeah, I just I just loved Origins. I just I it was the new Assassin's Creed. I knew it'd be good, but my God, that game just exceeded my expectations in every way so much. Well, I remember. And my third and final. I was gonna say I just as, a, as, as a like a little tangent. Um, First, I just wanted to say that I I was thinking about including any of the Batman games on this because they're all games that I have played and enjoyed thoroughly as well, such as yourself yeah. and Platinum them all as well. But I just picked other ones instead. Yeah. Um, with Origins, though, I remember when I first you know when I first got it, it was when me and you and Bruno were first sort of in our chat together, just when it was us three yeah. lads, the lads chat before we brought in all them women. Um, <laughs> And I remember posting a lot of just random screenshots uh, that I took from the game yeah. when I was playing through Origins. I still have some of them on my phone. I think I have a lot of camel, camel testicle pictures on my phone for some reason. Yeah, you've <laughs> lost your camel. Yeah. You have to use a camel in Origins. You can't use a horse. That's just wrong. Yeah, no, you need to use a camel. Yeah. But anyway, you carry on. I, I, always, I always included Arkham City for the 360 ones, but I didn't want to have like too many of the same franchise in my thing and plus like I said Arkham Knight I just you know Arkham Knight was just so much more special to me and my fi the final one kind of cheeky but meh Halo the Master Collection oh, that's because that is, I, I know it's a collection of old games and that but <laughs> I don't know it's just all, like, all the like, all the good I not Halo 5 because Halo games together Especially since I've added ODST and Reach and all that to it. It's just so... I've said there's so much content on that one disc. And the content is just such ridiculously high quality. And plus, yeah, it had a kind of crappy launch and was in a so-so state for a while. But for like the past year or more, 343 have like doubled down on polishing it, like adding to it, fixing it. They're really passionately and like solidly supporting it 
in it. And it's just like they've all been releasing it on PC mm. and that. It's just like, it's just, head, like, it's just such good, it's so good to see a developer actually like go, like be like, okay, you were all looking forward to this and we screwed up, but we want to, you know, we want to make amends for it. We want to, you know, polish it and make it what you want it to be. And they've been doing that. And it's just a beautiful thing to see a developer do that. I know. If only other developers, <laughs> 2K, <laughs> would do that as well. Let's not go there. Let's not go there. Let's not go there. I will be going there soon, though, when we get to the platter chat. So. Oh. Oh. But so, then yeah, we... those are my Xbox One. Those are my Xbox One ones. Fair enough. One, one, one. So that one, is one, one, it. One, then. One, 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 one. then I'm ending it now for our landmark games. We spent 50 minutes talking about landmark yeah. games. Christ. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, those. I, I, I think it was relatively interesting, though. No, it's no, I'm not. I'm not... If, anyone, if anyone wants to put in the comments, there, landmark games, go for it. Yes, please do. I'm not just. I'm not looking at you, Bruno, but I'm definitely looking at you, Bruno. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Um, yeah. I, I'm trying. I'm trying to like in my head. I'm trying to think of what would be a landmark game for Bruno. I don't really know. Halo, Halo One. Def- I know Halo One would be probably the first Ori as well because he loves Ori. Maybe Sunset Overdrive. I don't know. I was going to say that, but I was going to say it as a. J- I was going to say that, but as a joke, but um. Yeah, I, don't, I can't think of anything else. But yeah, I think definitely him, Halo 1 and the first story would be. Maybe Mario, because he's Italian. Well, 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 we're going by that logic. He's a lot of Assassin's Creed 2 and brotherhood. Well, like we are just so. kidding, by the way. We know it's probably not that. Yeah, um, so yeah, anyway, let's move on to the plot chat. Woo! Woo! Then finishing off with comments. Um, so the plat chat is a four plat special. Woo! Four plat special, four platinums to talk about this week since we recorded last week. I know, right? Absolutely. This is, you know, don't stop me now, or else it would be a buzzkill. I'm pretty close to my score streak now. Um, so yes, last time I talked uh, about my Revelations Platinum and the Order 1886 and how I was on God of War and God of War is the first one on the list I went through the game I had to get a lot of collectibles I had to finally finish fighting all the Valkyries thank God um, and yeah I, it, it was a game that I had a few bits to get on but I enjoyed doing after that and I mean literally hours after that I went on to Modern Warfare 2 Remastered um, pretty much I think I pretty much put God of War down, then took out the disc and put in Modern Warfare 2. Why well, I say put in Modern Warfare 2 is digital. I started Modern Warfare 2, and then I went on and got the Platinum for that one as well, um, which I had to get the Pit Trophy, which I finally got after many, many tries. Christ, I didn't think I was ever going to get it. And I remember I, I've sent the um, I sent the my uh, my uh, Pit Run through on onto Viber, and I don't know what did you what yeah. did you think of my Pit Run? Did you you know? I thought you did it for, you did it pretty perfectly like I know uh, was... I don't see how I'm of course going to try and get that achievement when I get of it to Remastered and I think that is, def- that is definitely a pretty good like sort of you know thing to have as reference you know a thing if you can get it as good get it if you can match this as per- mm. you know as best as possible you will get it I think it's 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 what I would say. The only thing about that trophy is it's it's much more about double kills than it is about running quickly. Because like, because yeah, because the higher accuracy bonus you get takes off time, and the less bullets you fire, the higher the accuracy bonus. So if you only fire one bullet to kill one target, and you get as many double kills as you can, then you fire less bullets. And if you can get like a hundred and sixty percent accuracy, you can knock off like ten seconds off your time. So it's uh, pretty handy. Um, then after that, we moved on, and uh, finally, I'm glad to say, the Mafia 2 Platinum. <laughs> Christ. <laughs> Nearly over a month, over a month since Mafia 2, uh, well, over a month since I earned the Platinum, but didn't earn the Platinum, because um, it had a glitch trophy on it, and they finally, finally, finally released a patch. When I was reading through the patch notes online, I was so nervous to think that perhaps they'd not bothered to fix that part and just fix glitches. <laughs> I was leaning through it thinking, oh, all right, patch notes, what have they fixed? And they finally said, oh, issues experienced by the enforced trophy. I was like, yes, thank God. (laughs) 
And I finally went on there and I got it. Thank God for that. Um, and then, to finish off, my most recent platinum was The Last of Us Part 2. Um, which I got... A very controversial game. Very controversial game. I loved it. Thank you very much. Um, I don't care what other yeah. people think. I loved it. So, um, And I still love it. And I will always love it. And I love the world, the story, everything about it. And I'm not getting into that discussion. Um... But anyway, yes, yeah, so I got the Platinum for it. I got it on the Friday at midnight. I started playing it. Um, the following Tuesday, I had Platinum it after going through two and a half playthroughs. Um, yeah, a really great game. Just really enjoyed playing it. Uh, a long game as well, though, because it's a 30-hour game. Which is a lot longer, considering... That is pretty long for, like, a, just a single-player sort for, of game. For a Naughty Dog game, I don't know how long that is, but... For, well, the way I'm going to make it clear to you like this is normally Naughty Dog games split their games up into chapters. Um, so you normally, yeah. you know, have a certain amount of chapters. Now, in the past, Uncharted, I think the most I've seen Uncharted get to is about 26 chapters. Which is yeah. about maybe, you know, you could probably do that in 12 to 13 hours if you wanted to, yeah? Um, yeah. Last of Us Part 2 has 45 chapters. So yeah, it's it's a very long yeah it's a very long game. But I mean, once again, it's it's kind of good because you don't want it to end when you're playing it. So, uh, but unfortunately, as all things do, it does. Um, so yeah, that is my plat chat. And and currently, as we were discussing, I'm just at the moment building sanctuary hills, and I haven't got any immediate other platinums to go through because I've kind of gone through a lot of the ones I seek to achieve during lockdown now. Um, you know, so uh, yeah. I think I've gotten like 20 odd platinums in lockdown, so I can't be that bad for a few months, can it? I've been averaging maybe one or two platinums per week since we went on lockdown, so. That's a good use of your that's a, time. That's, that's a, yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. I could be furthering or stopping world hunger, but no, I'm, I'm getting platinums. So, uh, yeah, um, any games you've been playing recently just to touch upon? Uh, I was going to do um, get the last achievements I need for the first Force Unleashed game. Like, I'd have, ideally, I'd have had them by now, but then I found out that to get the, unlock the highest difficulty in the DLC, you have to have it unlocked in the base game, and to do that, you had to, you know, play through the base game, and then you just get lower difficulty to unlock it. I see. So, so, so I played the first Force Unleashed again, and so at the same time I said about it on this podcast, but... You know, I didn't mind playing it again. I played like 30 times. It's I, not particularly I long, it, no. I still like it. You can finish it uh, in a day quite simply, can't you, I think? The yeah. story. It's not a particularly long, long story. Not quite as long as that. Of course, last time I did, I don't know how it's difficult to but, but it's not quite as long as I remember. I still say it's a good length. Um, and then yesterday... I did the sequel because I still hadn't played the sequel in years and I just felt like playing, playing the sequel and Fair my enough. god the, it's not a terrible game but outside of the graphics that is the like it's one of the biggest like downgrades I've seen from a sequel like literally ever like again apart hmm. from the graphics it is weaker in every single possible aspect Interesting, because like, I prefer the combat, it. the enemy variety, the level variety, the level design, the story, everything. It's just so much weaker than in the first one. Interesting. And it's kind of disgusting. Interesting. I kind of prefer it to the first one. Mm. That's interesting. I, pre- I think the one of the parts I like about it more is the fact that the combat is so much better. Yeah, the saber combat is better, but at the same time, the game, the sequel's so much easier, and the enemies are so less. Like, not only is there so many less types, but they're so like they're not half as fun to fight because there ain't as many types, and the game is easier. <laughs> so it's kind yeah. of like you've got a better lightsaber, you've got better a better lightsaber combat, but it's still not as good as the first game because the things you're using it against aren't as fun. Fair enough. So it's kind of a, that is a double edged sword, I would definitely say. But I do mm. definitely see where you come from from that aspect. Although Fall in Order defeats mm. both as my favourite combat easily. Well, my favourite part um, is when <laughs> my favourite part is now when Starkill has gone to a uh, new or is now living in Oregon in a zombie apocalypse. Mm. Mm. For some reason he went yeah, over to Dick. 
I know. Some people might get that reference. I don't know if everyone's going to get it, do you think? Uh, I'm sure some people will. What's his name again? It's um, Sam something? Uh, Sam Whitworth. That's it, yes. Yeah, Sam Whitworth, who yeah. plays Starkiller in both the Force Unleashed games, uh, also plays Deacon St. John in Days Gone, which is all my reference. Yeah, um, he's so, got a bunch of stuff. We don't need to come to that. We've already done that on the podcast. Yeah, so uh, yeah, we did. We did for some reason have a bit of a Sam Witwer tangent. Many podcasts to go for some reason. Um, but yeah, so cu- ending today, we're going to be talking. Our, well, reading our comments once again. We have a selection from Bruno. Now I've been glancing over these whilst you listed your game, and he seems to be in a bit of an aggressive mood this week. He's very defensive in some of these comments, but um, I enjoy reading them in a def- in a possible defensive Bruno voice. So uh, yes. <laughs> We're going to start out with, um, I'm going to try to add as much context to these as possible. Um, His first comment, and I think, were we talking about his body last week? Uh, I I think we were talking about skin tone and stuff. I don't remember saying about his actual figure. Well, I feel like we were talk- we definitely mentioned we definitely talked about his ass and whether we not we thought it'd be hairy or not, didn't we? Yeah, we said about several people's asses. Yes. Oh, yes, because you were talking about Evie's ass to begin with. Yeah, 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 yeah. And your desire yeah. to ram your face you're in between it. What her reaction to that will be? It was, your des- it was your desire to put your face in between the cheeks and go. <laughs> wasn't it? Just read. Just read. <laughs> Um, so yes anyway so I think we talked I think we just I think I particularly described Bruno as I imagine him to be skinny and and pale <laughs> um, and his comment from that is hi Ben or hey Ben I'm not I'm really not that skinny and I do go outside often even if my skin colour is pretty white um, I still don't know how to imagine him in real life to be honest I feel a bit like Squidward from Spongebob I don't know why I imagine him being like that <laughs> <laughs> like kind of a bit skinny but also if you get him annoyed about something he'll whine on about why he thinks you're wrong for the entire day just kidding we're just kidding we're just kidding Bruno we're just kidding um, just a joke. but Alex liked that <laughs> um, last week we also talked about beard culture in different um, countries um, towards the end um I talked. I remember particularly mentioning about Sweden, how it's seen as a sign of being a man. We talked a lot about Italian facial hair, <laughs> um, and Bruno, uh, as I have requested, has left a comment about Italian facial hair. So what he says is this: He says, "What I know about Italian beard culture is that most people here do want to grow themselves a beard. It is considered as manly. Thankfully, more and more people are starting to become more and more individu- individ- Ugh, I can't talk individualistic." I'm a firm believer of people's self-realisation and I think that societal norms like the ones that say that men have to have a beard in order to be considered real men are hurting that. Italy, in that regard, still has quite some work to do. Um, Like many countries in that form. Um, Moving on. Having a beard is considered like more manly. I do know it's felt like me and you once or twice have tried to like grow a beard to be a bit I have quite a fri- I have quite a I have quite the thriving pubis. Does that count as manly? Uh, I don't know. You're not sure it's Bruno. Bruno, if my penis is more hairy, do I be more manly? Please let us know. You don't need to be considered more hygienic. <laughs> what? Well, yes, but then again, they say it's a good thing to have more hair because it's a protective aspect, isn't it? So I don't know. I don't know. Bruno, let us know what you think. Um, so, also, we discussed um, particularly protagonist and antagonist last time, and we were obsessed yeah, with the idea that there was no, like, going to be a yeah, word. No word press, yeah. I still feel like in my there head that. No what we were looking for. I don't know what happened to us. We seem to become bewitched of this idea that there was a word that existed for this yeah, thing. I don't it know just, why. Uh, it just seems like that sort of thing where there you know, Would might be. have been a Should word be. for it, but it's, it's not. Yes, yeah, so so I have to think of one. In in my in my uh, in my mind, I still feel like there is one hidden somewhere in lexicography somewhere. 
somewhere. So, but what Bruno says anyway is about the whole protagonist antagonist discussion. The word you were looking for to describe Catwoman is probably anti-hero, meaning someone who acts out of pure yeah, selfish self-interest rather than serving the greater good. Now, yeah, I don't know. I mean, but then again, Catwoman has these moments of acting out of being, you know, not just her self-interest as well, doesn't she? You know? Mm. Time is really complex character, and that's why she's so compelling. Mm. There is times when she does think a lot about herself, but then there's plenty of times where she abandons her own self-interest in to help the greater good. So anti-hero does do it, but I still feel like there is, should be a better way of describing it than just anti-hero. You know? Um, but there you go. Uh, so, oh, actually, he actually goes on to say this. Uh, However, anti-hero is a word that only covers someone's position on the moral spectrum. It doesn't describe what a particular character has in the story or what part they have in the story. There is no word for a protagonist that's also on the antagonist side of things. There's just protagonist and antagonist. But perhaps maybe we can invent one um, one day. Um, And then he gets angry about the idea of us... uh, or me saying that I thought the eyes could only see 30 FPS, um, which at the time was just me kind of guessing, which I, th- I think I said about five times that I was just guessing and I didn't actually say it was fact, but it seemed to have riled him anyway. Um, so if you'd like, I can read this in my riled Bruno voice. It's quite a big one, uh, I've heard. And it is. The phrase that human eyes can't see beyond 30 frames per second is one of the most frustratingly idiotic things I've heard. What next? The earth is flat? It's simply not true. People who don't see the difference just need to go and search for a good showcase on the internet where objects moving in multiple frame rates are confronted side by side. You do not need, you do see a difference. And to me, it's clear as day. Now, I believe at the time I said that in my experience from making YouTube videos, I just think that adding, having something in 60 FPS, as he says, makes the thing look smoother. But I believe in the sense of making YouTube videos that it's only worth applying it to things that really need it, such as uh, maybe a travelling vlog where you want the extra fluidity. Uh, I don't think everything needs it. Uh, Carrying on. The only credibility I've ever given to a game rate study was one which was said you can't see the difference beyond 70 FPS. Apparently everything above that will look just as smooth. Then, why would you want to have games run at, say, 120 FPS? Well, they might not look any smoother, but they will sure play smoother. Higher frame rates are less about the visual aesthetic and more about player response. They would only per- they would only perfect gaming. P.S. Don't give yourself false expectations. The tech inside the next gen won't be able to guarantee a 4K 120fps norm. Only games with big losses in visual fidelity will be able to run at 120fps or let alone be rendered at 4K. However, a lot of games want to look nice too, so I don't think we will break out of the current 30fps and 60fps split. For example, Assassin's Creed Valhalla is apparently still running on 30fps at next gen. You should focus your attention on real-time ray tracing instead. That is going to be something completely new on consoles. Opinions? I actually said to Bruno, well, like, quite a while ago, as long I'm not, like, given a choice, would I prefer 60 FPS to 30? I don't know, but as long as the frame rate is, like, stable, I'm not mm. one of these ones, so it should be 60 FPS. Well, I mean... I'm not one of those ones at all. As long as the game has a stable, solid, like, FPS, mm. I'm like, okay, fine, fine. You know, from well, personally, it, like, make I, it look beautiful. I, for one, I'd like to vouch for 10 FPS, because whilst playing Fallout 4, it's been really enjoyable to move around like PowerPoint sometimes, and to have the game freeze I mean, around. Down, yeah. Oh, this takes mm-hmm. me back. Yeah, 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 it's exactly the nostalgia. 10 FPS is where it's at. I think that's what they should be marketing for the new consoles, really. Um, but yeah, you know, I don't care about the FPS side as long as it runs okay, as you say. The only time that FPS makes any difference to me is when I'm making videos, and that's because I choose whether or not I want to record something in FPS in 60 or 30, depending on what it is. And like I say, if I record gameplay in 30 FPS or 60 FPS, I don't notice that much of a difference. But I do notice a profound difference between any vlogs that I make that are 30 and 60. 
the vlogs that I make, uh, particularly ones where there's a lot of movement, like ones where we do go travelling places, there's so much smoother uh, in the way that they look uh, if you make them in 60 FPS and also then render them in 60 FPS as well. There are a lot of people that film things in 60 FPS and then render them out in 30, so it makes it completely redundant. Um, but yeah, it's definitely, they look a lot smoother, but it's not essential really. I think a higher frame rate is kind of, well, not a necessity, but it's a nice thing to have for playing online. So when it is the Wars 4 and 5, they do 30 FPS for the single player and then 60 for the multiplayer. Because when you're playing online multiplayer, you want the game to run as smoothly and as like, well as possible, don't you really? As you probably know from like, Marvel 2 experience and whatnot. Well, I'd be happy with just no lag. <laughs> really. I think, uh, if anything, online gaming, if you can perfect not having much lag and the lag not doing much, you know, of an effect, then uh, I think you're all right there, really. So many memories of running into a room and then the game lagging and then me appearing back outside of the room again as if I never run in there in the first place. <laughs> or me shooting someone. Violence in video games don't turn people into murderers. Lag does. Mm. Or one or two memories of having shot someone, killed them, the lagging then happening, and then finding out that they'd actually killed me, somehow. So I'm almost convinced that lag... I think I'm almost convinced that lag is not actual lag, but it is people that have perfected time travel. And the lag is actually our reality changing before our eyes in a heartbeat because they've actually gone back and altered reality. Have you again? Well, I don't know about you know rubber banding and such. That's just more funny, um, <laughs> you know. So sometimes glitches in games, even though you think they shouldn't be in there, they are funny just because they are. Um, I've had a few funny ones. Um, I remember I had that one in L.A. Noir, didn't I? That I described not long ago in a podcast where um, where the hat was on an invisible person that the person should have been wearing a hat but in the cutscene the hat moved off his head to the side of him so it looked like there was an invisible person beside him wearing a hat and his head had receded into his body so only his like nose and eyes were poking out of the top of his neck so weird but that funny it was funny though <laughs> I've seen plenty of good ones of like um, people do make a lot of them online a lot of good ones have come out of Resident Evil games I've seen there's a whole series online of where someone's made a series of like one of the in-game protagonists having PTSD or having schizophrenia because they've they've made a lot of the cutscenes, but there's a game where the it's glitched and they've removed the person that the the protagonist was talking to. So you just have these cutscenes of a game protagonist literally saying words out to no one and in no response or anything. And gesticulating until all. Well, there's there they are, they are out there if you find them. There's plenty from Resident Evil, and there's just there. Oh, yeah. something out there. Yeah, I know. I mean, I'm I'm sure if I, I can think of anything right now, I could find. Maybe like I don't know a donkey coming. I could find that. I bet. Do you think I could find that? I reckon I could find that, don't you? I'm gonna Google it right now. Yeah, of course you Um. Okay, let's have a look. Oh, there's oh, a man. Well, there's a man coming inside a donkey. Does that count? Uh, where well, the donkey comes, so the, yeah. Good point. Uh, any monetization you might have gone from this podcast. The web the website that it's on is called www.bestialitysextaboo.com. <laughs> That sounds about right. Um, yeah, yeah, now, nah, yeah, okay, <laughs> I'm going to get off this now. I didn't actually watch the video, by the way, I just did a Google video search, so I could see the thumbnails. Uh, yeah, not good, not good, don't recommend it, personally, but I'm sure Alex is kind of tempted to look up that. I don't recommend watching it or doing it. I don't recommend either, don't do bestiality, everyone. It's not cool. <laughs> It's not, yeah, cool, not to cool shag animals, okay? Yes. Quickly going back to Bruno's thing. <laughs> what exactly is ray tracing? Like, I know of it, but I don't exactly know what it is. Um, you know? I 
feel like I do, but I'm I just. To do it like I feel like I do, but I'm just gonna go back quickly. It's just, um, ah, yeah, no, it's what I thought it was. It, it's basically the definition that Wikipedia has is ray tracing is rendering technique for generating an image by tracing the path of light as pixels in an image plane and simulating the effects of its encounters with virtual objects. So it's kind of a lot of the way. It's kind of you know the way light sort of light works and. To, to make it sound really dumb, it's the way that the way that light works within the the game. Uh, it's, it makes it sound really dumb, but you know, I know I can't think of a better way of describing it apart from what they've said there. But um, that'd be cool to see because lighting can play a big part in a game's visuals. Like if it's like at uh, night time and you're inside a building and you have like moonlight shining like through um, windows, or if it's sunny and you have the light shining through and you have like dust particles and that through it, lighting can add a, a lot to a video game's visuals. So that'd be quite cool to have. Yeah, no, it's yeah, it should be. But anyway, yeah, that is it for this week's podcast. Um, it's been a long one. Uh, apologies for that. <laughs> if you're still here. Oh, oh God. But anyway, yeah, thank you for watching this week's podcast. I hope you uh, liked it. Um, and yeah, it's goodbye from me. We didn't even talk. We didn't even mention Wangs this week. No, nah, well, and, well, and it is goodbye. Well, I did. I think I covered that with Donkey Wangs, really, didn't I? Oh yeah, yeah. Or yeah. the man's Wang that was inside the donkey. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know why the internet doesn't take these videos okay, down. <laughs> I probably can't make that the title of the video, though, can I? No. I don't know. As if I can talk about donkey sex, and I probably, I probably will get taken down. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, goodbye from me. And it's goodbye from me. That's good. See you all in the next episode. Goodbye. Toodles. Ah, I have expected you. Greetings. Do you know why I live here? Hmm, yes. I have been pondering on exactly that question. All in good time. First, a question for you. Imagine but a whisper pushing aside all in its path. What will you burn? What will you spare? Hmm, yes. Few could resist such a challenge. You once told me you did not believe in destiny. Do you have no better reason for acting than destiny? Are you nothing but a plaything of fate? Hmm, yes. Do not be afraid. Fulfill your destiny. Few could resist such a challenge. Why do you delay? What else would you seek? Go then. Fare thee well. Do not be afraid. Remember well. Power, you have it, but power is inert without action and choice. <laughs>